Good morning, everybody. Welcome to BCC Online Service. Thank you for joining in my home as we worship together and as we are taught together. We might feel scattered in our own homes, kind of isolated from one another, but today we gather together as one church. We are one church gathered together, and we're going to continue to look to the answer of a question. How now shall we live? How shall we live now in this ever changing culture. And we turn to Peter to look for answers. And last week, Peter talked about one group of which we live among. He called them the pagans. And he said that we are to live such good lives among them that they will see our good deeds. We are to live good lives and live out good deeds. The second group Peter is talking to, we're going to talk about today. And that is each of us in church community. How now shall we live among one another. And Peter gives us three motivations, three reasons why we should live this way. The first motivation is that we are to live like Jesus, to live like Jesus. The second motivation is that we are to bring glory to God. And the third motivation is that the return of Jesus is soon. Now you may say, Peter thought it was soon. Peter had no timeline established. He just knew that the last event in all of redemptive history in God's timeline was the return of Christ. And he said it was the last thing to happen. In fact, in 1 Peter 4, 7, he says, the end of all things is near. And what he means is just that last event is close. It could happen tomorrow or a thousand years from now. He knew it was the next event and it motivated him to action. As we think about living among church community, as we live together as followers of Jesus in the community at BCC, Peter gives us some great advice. We turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, and he says this, above all, love each other deeply, for love covers over a multitude of sins. It's that simple. That's how he wants us to live among one another, that we would love each other deeply. Let's turn our attention to a video that will set up the rest of what I want to say today. When did we forget how to love? Did it happen suddenly? Or was it a gradual decline? When did we forget the very foundation of the gospel? For God so loved. Love is what moved God to action. Love is what held Jesus to the cross. Love is what rolled away the stone. But we, we've forgotten that part. Without love, we are simply a resounding gong, a clanging cymbal, a bunch of noise. Without love, we are nothing. Is that what people see in us? Meaningless? empty noise love is supposed to be patient and kind gentle not angry or arrogant yet in our effort to stand on truth we have forgotten the very thing these truths are based on love Never once did Jesus fail in this. Not in his heartbreak or his anger. Not in his joy or his betrayal. His default has always been love. Maybe it's time the church was more like Jesus.
Well, isn't that a great video? That's such a strong reminder of how we are to love deeply in a world where the definition of love has got kind of muddy, when the expressions of love and the way it plays out is so often broken, when love is frail or fragile, where so many people wonder, am I truly loved or am I worthy of love? That's the way we are to love, to love deeply. But let me remind you that Peter is not talking about loving the culture. Although that's important, and we'll talk about that in future weeks. We are talking about loving one another as followers of Jesus in the church. I want to put this quote on the screen. Christ followers need to be diligent in their love for each other in the church in order that the world looking for love can find it in a place they never thought possible or they never thought they would. Peter says in 1 Peter 4.8, above all, this is more important than all the other things I have written. He says, above all, this is of priority. This is the most important thing. Pay attention. Listen to my words. Love each other deeply. That word could be translated fervently. It means to strain or to stretch or it's strenuous reaching. It's the picture of an athlete that is stretching and straining in an attempt to win the gold medal, the prize at the end of the race. It describes a racehorse in full gallop trying to win the race. It's with all our might and with all our strength and with all our energy. It's about straining and stretching strong, earnest, deep, ardent love for one another not just heartfelt affection. That might be part of it, but it is a willing, active choice to love this way. You choose to love fervently. It is loving one another in church community here at BCC with a special degree and a depth of love. It's about loving each other in the church and beyond, but that's not what he's talking about here. It's holding nothing back. It's giving all you've got It is stretching to make it happen with energy and passion attached to it. Now, Paul knows that some people are not easy to love. He's got this guy in his life. His name's Paul. And I think because of the clash of their personalities and different agendas, they they found each other hard to love. He knows that there will be different personalities and temperaments that will clash, that there are different ways of doing things and different family histories and different areas of brokenness. And he knows that nobody is perfect in church community. You know, there's this little poem that we used to say in the church I grew up in. It said, to live above with saints we love. Oh, that will be glory. To live below with the saints we know, that's a different story. But no matter how different we are, we need to love like this, with this kind of depth and intensity and passion, even when we have our differences. You see, Peter wouldn't care what your Enneagram numbers are or what Myers-Briggs says about your personality, whether you're touchy-feely or not. He would say that we need to love each other with fervent love no matter what. Peter's already written about this in his letter. It's just a recurring theme that we are to love deeply, deeply love one another in spiritual community. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22, Peter says this. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, in other words, you become followers of Jesus, you need to now have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply, from the heart. The word sincere here means not with the wrong motives, not with, you know, selfish something to get out of it for you motive. It's genuine, not fake. You're not pretending. You're not play acting. It should be sincere, genuine love. It's the unconditional love that Jesus has for us. We're to do it deeply. We're not to love each other superficially. We're not to say the words or show the expressions. We are to love deeply and we're to love from the core of who we are. We're to love from our heart. Peter said last week in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, the second occurrence of this, this is what he said. Show proper respect to everyone. 
love the family of believers. We are to love the family of believers. Some people, you know, can love all sorts of people in their culture. They can get along so well, but they don't have the same kind of diligent, fervent, passionate love for those in their spiritual community. I'm here to tell you as Christ followers, our love starts with the community of faith. We get this right, then we can love our culture better, but we must love community first before we can love culture second. It's like loving God before you love others. You must love community before you can love the culture. You know, you can say all, what, all you want about me. You can criticize me. You can speak negatively about me. Do something to hurt me, and I'll take it. Yeah, sometimes I'll get angry. Sometimes I won't. But you know what makes me angry? It really gets my blood boiling. You take a shot at one of my kids. You say something mean about one of my children. You criticize them. You hurt them. You wound them. You do something to them, and you will feel my wrath. On the other side, you want to know what makes me feel good, connects me with you, brings out the best in me? When you do or say something good about my kids. Friends, I think that's how God feels. I really do. I think he feels the same way. He is not happy. I think it kind of gets his blood boiling when we hurt one another as his kids in community. But I think it brings joy to his heart when we love each other as his kids. The third reference that Peter has made already to this idea of loving deeply is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. He says, finally, all of you, this is not, none of us are, are excused. Be like-minded, unified, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. He's saying that we need to have this kind of love that is laced with compassion and not criticism, humility and not pride or personal desires. It needs to be sympathetic, not superficial. It needs to be unifying, not dividing. You know, I find it so interesting, so interesting that this bold, impetuous fisherman, this man's man, talks so much about love, so much about love and about loving one another deeply. And I think what motivates Peter, what motivates Peter is he heard what Jesus said in John 13, 34 and 35. Listen to what Jesus said in John 13. He says, a new command, a new command I give you. I'm restating that all of the other commands are kind of summed up this way. This new command is love God and love each other. That's the new command. Jesus is saying all of the other commands, all of the 614 in the Old Testament can be boiled down to this one command, this new command I give you is this, love one another. Love one another. Love here is a verb. It's a word of action, not a feeling. It's like, don't feel something towards that person over there. It's go over there and love that person. He wasn't commanding them to feel something. He was commanding to them to go and do something. And then he pushes it a lot further. He says this, as I have loved you, as I have loved you, go and love one another. This is said to them before he dies on the cross. He's just reminding of the way he's loved them for the last three and a half years that they've been together about the depth of his love. Gracious love, compassionate love, merciful love, forgiving love. He says, I've loved you. You know how I've loved you. Now go and love one another. One another. It wouldn't be until the next few days that they would truly understand the enormous depth and significance of his love when he actually died for them on the cross. Jesus died on the cross, covered in blood, sweat, the saliva of other people who spit on him. And in agony, a horrific, painful death, he dies to demonstrate the sacrificial nature of his love. His love was genuine, sincere, sympathetic, humble, compassionate, but it was deep. And his death showed the depth of his love. 
And you know, none of us deserve it. None of us are good enough to deserve it. We're not lovable enough, special enough to deserve it. None of us can deserve it. The writer Paul says in Romans 5, 8, this is how God demonstrates his own love, his love for us. While we were still sinners, enemies, we wanted nothing to do with God, Christ died for us. Even when we didn't deserve it, Christ died for us. For Christ followers, this is just one single, simple command. We are to love one another the same way that he has loved us. And then he says this, by this, by this one thing, how you love one another, will all people, everyone, no one will be excluded. Everyone will know that you are my disciples, my followers. Why? Because of the way you love one another. He says there's one command and there's one mark. The mark is to love God and to love others deeply, especially one another in the community of faith. And by doing this, you will have this one mark that shows our world that you are truly his followers. You see, when we create a countercultural community infused with the deep and fervent love demonstrated by Jesus, people will notice. They will connect the dots. They will point to Jesus because this kind of love is so different, so countercultural. And Jesus is saying that this one mark, this one thing defines genuine Christ followers. And that one mark is the way they love one another. It's not about how much we know. It's not about how much we do. It's really about how much that loves that all that matters. And Jesus shows his love to us. He demonstrated his love to us, how he loves others. And Jesus said, you've seen how I love? Come follow me. Come imitate me. Come act like me. Love like me. You know, one of Jesus' other closest followers, his name was John. He had the nickname, the one that Jesus loved. I would like that nickname. I don't know why he got it, maybe because he was the youngest or maybe he was the most tender-hearted. But John writes a pretty bold statement, a pretty bold statement in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. Listen as I read these statements of John. These are bold. Look what he says. We know that we have come to know him, that we have this relationship with Jesus if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, love God, love others, They're a liar, and the truth, that's being Jesus, is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him, how we have a relationship with Jesus. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did, and that includes loving as Jesus did. And then he goes on, yet I'm writing you a new command, right? We've already heard that. The truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. He's saying, you're starting to do this. Then he makes this and he gives this warning. Anyone who claims to be in the light, to have a relationship with Jesus, but hates his brother or sister in community is still in darkness. They're not in Jesus. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there's nothing to nothing in them to make them stumble. Then he says this, but if you hate your brother and sister, talking about community, is it, you are still in the darkness and you're walking around in that darkness and you don't know where you're going because the darkness has blinded you. The lack of love, friends, this lack of love can blind each of us. What John is saying is powerful, that our love for God is demonstrated by our love for others and faith community. He uses brother and sister language. He says, and if you don't love one another in faith community, don't say that you love me. Don't say that you have a relationship with me, because if you had that, you would obey me and you would love others deeply. This is a pretty bold and radical statement that should make all of us, it made me this week, stop, pause and think, how am I doing? You see, Peter heard this from Jesus and wrote about it, but he also read it from Paul and he wrote about it. Paul says this, this great verse, Galatians 5, 6. He says this, the only thing, the only thing, sounds like Peter above all, the only thing that really truly matters is our faith expressing itself through how? Through love. Faith is not expressed by what we know, It's not expressed by how much of the Bible we've read or memorized, how often we go to church, how often we serve, how much we give. It's only expressed one way. One way only is faith truly expressed, and it's how we love. And the only 
the only command of Jesus is to love God with all their heart and love others as themselves. That's the command. And there's only one mark of the Christ follower, and that is to fervently one another, love one another in our faith community. Now, loving others in the body of Christ in the church doesn't happen naturally. It's not easy. It's not our gravitational pull. It takes work, hard work, straining and stretching. It takes a willing heart, a willingness to stretch and strain in order to love like this. This is graduate level loving. And all of this might sound like theory to this point, but I want to kind of wrap up by letting you know how it looks practically, how we could put it into practice. And Peter tells us, he says this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. We're to love each other deeply. And then he says, here's how you do it. Love covers over a multitude of sins. And when the word sin used here means to miss the mark, to not hit the target, to be off target. When we're not in line with the way God wants us to live and the way God wants us to love, it can include sinful action. It can also include bad and broken behavior. He says, when someone isn't loving God or loving others, that's what sin is. And he says that we love covers over what? A multitude of these sins, big things, small things, many things, many times. It's not that we're condoning or ignoring sin. It's not that we're turning a blind eye towards it or excusing bad or broken issues of character or behavior. That's not what he's saying. What covering over means means to hide it from others, to put something over it so others don't see it. It's about not spreading or exposing the sin or issues of broken character. We don't expose it through gossip or malicious talk or critical communication about a person or put downs, tear downs, or slander. Oh, there's this wonderful picture of what this looks like in scripture. It's found right in the beginning of the Bible. It's found in Genesis chapter nine. And it reads this way. Let me read this story. It says, Noah, the guy with the ark, a man of the soil, he was a farmer, proceeded to plant a vineyard. And when he drank some of his wine, too much of its wine, actually, it says he became drunk and he lay uncovered in his tent. He was naked and uncovered. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers. It's as if Ham went out. And I was going to say Ham spread it, but that would sound kind of funny. But Ham shared it. He laughed about it. He mocked his father for it, maybe gossiped for sure with his brothers. But Shem and Japheth, they didn't do that. It says this, they took a garment and they laid it across their shoulders and they walked in backwards so they couldn't even look at their father and they covered their father's naked body. That's what it means to cover over. And I'm gonna tell you, that Shem and Japheth were rewarded for their covering over their father's behavior, but Ham, it says, was cursed. You see, friends, when we truly love someone, we don't want to expose their brokenness to others. We don't want to go around gossiping about them. We don't want to slander them to others. We don't want to point fingers. We don't want to put them down. We don't want to try to ruin their reputation. If you love someone, you don't do that. These two boys love their dad. No, when you deeply love someone, who does something that is not right. It's a sin or it's some kind of bad behavior. You want to go and talk to them in a loving way, looking for ways to restore them, to help them, to heal them. But it's about being gracious to them. It's about forgiving them. It's about being merciful to them. That's the components of love. And so covering over is what we do when we deeply love. We don't expose it, but we cover it over. And I got thinking about how this could, you know, work in practical ways, practical ways, how we could live it out as a church community at BCC, how could love each other fervently and cover over a multitude of sins. And some of this I've shared just recently in messages, so it's going to be a bit of a review. But I think it's an important review for us to listen to and to look at, to remind ourselves, what does it mean to be in community and to love fervently? The first one is this. You've heard me say this before. We becomes more important than me. 
we becomes more important than me. What's good for the community of faith when we love one another is more important than what I want from the community of faith. We focuses on creating a deeper sense of Christian community where the good of others is more important than me getting what I want. A me focus turns into consumer Christianity where our focus wants, where we focus on our wants and our needs. And that's what matters most. Not what's best for the community, not what leads to loving others. We want what we want. And sometimes a me focus makes threats like this. Maybe we don't say it out loud, but we think it in our head. If I don't get what I want, if my needs are not met, if the style of preaching or the music doesn't suit me, if who's leading doesn't turn me on, if it isn't what I want or desire, if I don't get what I want over time, I leave. I leave. A we focus is so different than that. It's saying, let's do the hard work so that the needs of everyone can be met. The consideration of the needs of others becomes more important than my needs, although my needs have some consideration. But it takes loving consultation with one another. It takes consideration of one another. It takes conversation with one another. It's about working together. Love is about compromise. It's about a give and take. It's about being community together. And so we has to become more important than, than me. The community is more important than just what I want. Secondly, and you've all heard me say this a lot, we need to believe the best and not assume the worst of one another. It's not, we, we can't always be questioning the motives of others. They may do something. We can't just say, well, it's always something negative. It's about giving them the benefit of the doubt. It's loving enough to believe the best. Parents, we so often do this with our children. It's about loving them by believing the best and not assuming the worst. And even the most cynical and skeptical among us must learn to do that. The third is that conflict gets sorted out by peacemaking conversations as soon as possible so that grudges don't get established. You see, community is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of of a restoring, reconciling spirit. It's the willingness to work it out, to talk it out in love, peacemaking conversations. Friends, there is no place in the church for passive aggressiveness. There isn't. I believe passive aggressiveness is brokenness at its worst. It plays out when we gossip about others instead of talking to others who we might be in conflict with. It's being nice to someone's face when we're mean behind their back. It is being, it's slanderous instead of sorting it out. That's passive aggressive. It just lets things slide. Passive aggressive is peacemaking. It just allows things to be swept under the carpet. That is brokenness at its worst. We need to be peacemakers and have those conversations. Resolving conflict involves resolving com conversations that are laced with love and grace. Can I be pastoral for a moment, BCC, this morning? I've been here two and a half years. It's been wonderful. But one of the things I've noticed in, those, in that time is that there are some long-standing grudges, long-standing grudges among some of the people that have been building for years. And as your pastor, it's time to sort it out. It's time to talk it out. And if you need me to go with you and have that conversation with someone else, I'll do it. But my friends, I love you too much to let this fester in your soul because here's what I know. When we don't sort it out, it damages the blessing of God on our lives. I don't want that for you. And I love our church too much to be silent any longer. So let's work at sorting it out. Number four, a lack of loving others needs to be challenged. When somebody doesn't love someone else and it's very obvious and very evident, we need to have that conversation with them. Because here's what happens. 
when we allow other people not to love, when we allow them to slander and gossip and try to ruin a reputation, that leads to disunity. And there is no place for disunity in a loving church. When you look at the number of times that Jesus talks about disunity, it was, some of the, it was in the last prayer he prayed. He feels strongly about it, and we should too. And when we don't love, we disunify. And we can't let that happen. You see, I think all of us should be willing to have loving, grace, gracious, truth-filled conversations with one another. When we don't see a lack of love that's leading to disunity for the sake of the church, for the people inside the walls, but even more importantly, so we can be a credible witness to the world around us. So the mark of love can shine brightly. And then lastly, to make this real practical, we need to love the leaders. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter writes to the leaders of the church, and he reminds them to love their church, to protect them the people, to lead willingly and diligently, to not be selfish, to roll up their sleeves and serve, to not be proud but humble, to live example of what it means to love. And then he says this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, listen to his words. In the same way, you who are younger. Now, he is not talking to just young people, although that's what it sounds like. He's talking to all who are not leaders. To all of you who are not leaders, submit yourself to your leaders. Submit yourself to your leaders. I think it's important that we love our leaders as part of loving one another. You see, your leaders, we, we, we use cultural terms like the leadership team and staff. That's not who your leaders are. They're shepherds. Shepherds entrusted to care for you and to lead this church. And I think the way leaders love their church, but even more importantly, the way people love their leaders and submit to their leadership sets the entire tone for the whole church and how it loves. You see, friends, a loving community of faith is able to tolerate and celebrate differences. It forgives more wrongs, prays more diligently for one another, believes the best, sorts out conflict, doesn't hold grudges, supports its leaders, deals with a lack of love when it is evident. And it's all done with a fervent, deep, straining, compassionate, sincere love. But maybe that's too much to remember. Maybe you need something, a simple takeaway today. What if we could simplify what it means to love one another simply by asking a single question in every interaction or conversation we have with every choice towards another person we make? What if we could ask one simple question? Well, Pastor Andy Stanley in his book, Irresistible, which is such an awesome book, he does that. He simplifies it to one question. Here's the question. What does love require of me? What does love require of me? That seems such a simple question, doesn't it? but it's such a challenging and demanding thing to live out. It, doesn't, it makes it less complicated, but more challenging and demanding. Yet this is the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to live like Jesus and to love like Jesus. It's asking that question over and over, what does love require of me? Imagine if we as a church in our culture where people might be skeptical of what we do do and might not agree with what we believe. But imagine if they could be envious about the way we loved and treated one another. You see, there was a time when the loving one another culture of the church stood out in direct contrast to the bite and devour one another culture around them. The church was about loving one another. The culture was biting and devouring. This made the church magnetic. It attracted people to it, even though they didn't believe what the church believed. And I think what was true then can be true now. When people look at the church, one single be, word should be used when they use the, that they use to describe BCC. Here's the word, love. Everyone in the world wants love. And friends, we have the best version of love we just need to love fervently with that love. 
BCC, you do pretty good at this. Actually, I need to congratulate you. I've been in the church world since I was, well, in diapers. And when it comes to wanting, loving one another, we do a pretty good job. Yes, we could raise the bar, and we need to raise the bar in certain areas, and I've mentioned that today. There's room for improvement, isn't there, in your life, in the life of our church? Just remember, the only thing that matters when it comes to your faith is expressing that faith through love. Asking the question, what does love require of me? Church, that's now. How shall we live? That's how we should live now in these changing times. Let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you for allowing me to speak clearly and boldly today. I love our church and I love our people. I do. I'm growing even deeper and deeper in our love for all of them. May we do that for one another. May we do those things that we need to do. May we make it not so much about us, but about our community. May we think and believe the best instead of assume the worst. Father God, may we sort out our conflicts. May we love our leaders and may we not tolerate a lack of love that leads to disunity. May we be that kind of church. Let our light shine and may that fuel for that shining light be the love for one another. May we be the kind of church that you love, proud of, excited about. Because when we do that, we will be an unstoppable force in this ever-changing culture. May we be that kind of church. Convict me, Lord. Convict us that we may love each other deeply because this kind of love covers over a multitude of sins. Thank you for speaking to us today clearly. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.